The story of our first speaker is about a young Dutch woman, Laura H., who left for the Caliphate. It's about her time before she left. It's about her time in the Caliphate with her husband and two young uh, children and about how she found her way back. It's been called a, a journalistic thriller and it's a book you simply cannot put away. It's not only a book, it's also a podcast and it started off as an article in the newspaper NRC Handelsblatt. Let's welcome the author, Thomas Rupp. Just to be sure. Can I take one of these? Is this on? Yeah. Yeah, so thank you very much for uh, being here today. Um, like one of the most important reasons for me to get into narr narrative journalism or written journalism was uh, so I would never, ever, ever have to get out of bed too early. Um, but today I'm very happy to make an exception. I'm very glad to see that <laughs> you did the same thing for me. And also uh, with all the other speakers on the program that I don't have any competition now because so far I'm the only one. So thank you very much for getting out of bed as well and uh, being here today. Um, at the start, I would like to take you back to the summer of 2016. Um, today, when you talk about ISIS, you talk about a group of terrorists with no territory anymore that still carry out and plan attacks, but at that time it was a very different situation. Um, the war against ISIS was just starting to gear up, um, and at the height of its power, ISIS had a territory of about 88,000 square miles uh, stretching uh, through Iraq and Syria. They had a population of about 8 million people. They were the richest, best funded jihadi organization the world had ever seen. Um, and they actually managed at first to build a state in Iraq and Syria. Um, and at first the world didn't really seem to know what to do with this new geopolitical force. Um, and it was not only considered an international problem that ISIS arose, but also a national one. Because most countries in the world saw a very worrying attraction that ISIS somehow had over uh, young Muslims in their countries. It wasn't just that ISIS carried out a series of attacks or through, throughout the world with increasing numbers of casualties in Paris, in Istanbul, in Copenhagen, and many, many other places, but also that countries saw that people within their own population were attracted and driven to go there and to join up, to make a life there, to fight there, to work there, and in a lot of cases to die there. Um, and in the time of its existence, ISIS managed to attract about 40,000 international men and women, mostly young men, uh, to join their ranks and to travel to Syria and Iraq. And I don't think there's, there's hardly any country in the world that didn't see this problem. And in Holland, we face this as well. And we in total have about 305, if I'm correct, uh, Dutch individuals who sought out the conflict zone in Iraq and Syria and joined ISIS. And when ISIS started to showing its true face and started carrying out attacks and showing that it was more than the, the true, pure Islamic state that it at first claimed to be, um, a lot of the, the, the people who joined tried to return. They came back. Uh, they came back to all countries and also to the Netherlands. So in the first two years of ISIS, about 50 of the 300 people that joined returned. And in a lot of cases, they weren't prosecuted um, because it was still unclear what they would have done there. And uh, there was a feeling, maybe a sentiment in society that it would be possible to maybe regret your decision of going there and come back without too much trouble. But that started to change after the Paris attacks. And in the summer of 2016, uh, the moment I was referring to earlier, the situation had completely changed. It was considered virtually impossible to leave ISIS territory without walking into a front line and being at least detected or probably killed in the struggle because the international coalition had surrounded every border that the ISIS territory had held at that point. And then on the 12th of July, 
in the summer of 2016, Dutch news was startled by a video that suddenly appeared. There were, and there hadn't been any ISIS returnees that year, or maybe there had been one, but nobody of these returnees ever had a face. You never learned who they were, and they never stood publicly on trial. And now suddenly, all over the international news, there was a video. Um, I'm going to show it to you, just I have one question. Maybe just for this one minute this video takes, uh, could you not videotape um, or uh, at least share uh, this video because it's not blurred and otherwise I would have uh, blurred it. So the live stream will be stopped for a minute as well. But this video suddenly rocked the Netherlands. Do I have to press this? Laura Angela Hansen. <laughs> Angela Hansen. <laughs> Where are you from? Uh, I was born in Den Haag and I lived in Sweet Lake City. I finished school but it's only uh, the middle school. I don't know how you say it in English. I, I had my house. I just had my new house and then I got pregnant and I was a house mom. I think now three years ago, I married. He's from Holland, but his parents are from Palestine. But he, he's born in Germany, I, I think. Germany, yes. I was nothing. I just, just, um, I don't know. I didn't do anything. My, my father is Catholic. My mother, nothing. So I don't, I didn't know uh, before so I was. So how did you know your dating website? Hmm. Dating website? Yes, uh, they have a site they call Muslim Muslimapp.com, and uh, that's how we m met each other. So this video suddenly turned up of a Dutch girl saying she was from Sweet Lake City and it didn't take too long for Dutch reporters, smart as we are, to figure out that it was actually a literal translation of Zoetermeer, um, a village uh, close to The Hague in Holland. And this was the first time that the ISIS joinee or returnee uh, got a face. And it was this young girl, she was 20 years old here, um, with the nail polish, and she didn't fit the image of what people here thought um, a terrorist or a jihadi or an ISIS joinee would look like. And she was all over the news with this, with this incredible story. She managed to escape. She was abducted by her husband, and the Kurds had saved her from the evil villains of ISIS. That was the narrative at first. And everybody speculated, well, maybe we can learn something from her. Maybe she can warn the Dutch youths on why not to join ISIS. So efforts were made to get her back uh, to the Netherlands, and here, she was arrested, which always happens if you return from the conflict zone. You're arrested until, well, your case is cleared and, and um, our prosecuting department knows what you've been up to. But then she remained in custody. And she remained in custody for two weeks, and then for a month, and then for two months. And she soon got transferred to, uh, this is one of the few pictures of the terrorism department in the Dutch prison facility of Vught which is one of the most advanced um, prisons in Europe, at least, where prisoners spend all their time, or at least 21 hours a day, in uh, full isolation. And all the other prisoners are either terrorism convicts or uh, terrorism suspects. And she was kept there. And she refused to speak to the police. And suddenly, in Dutch media, you saw the narrative beginning to shift. This girl that came up with, a, or at least at first told the heroic story you, you heard of her narrowly escaping death and managing to fight her way back into, uh, in, into friendly territory, was suddenly suspected of maybe being sent back by ISIS to carry out an attack in the Netherlands. And when at first she was already a famous case, or maybe the first real face of Dutch jihadism, now without a doubt she became the most famous, or at least mysterious, uh, Dutch jihadi around, and also what became, quickly became known as the Dutch homeland case. 
and she refused to speak. And for months on end, we, as the Dutch media, didn't really learn anything about who she was or what her intentions were and why she was being suspected of this thing. And all of this had absolutely nothing to do with me. Um, I work for a newspaper called NRC, uh, which is one of the uh, Dutch national newspapers. I, I wanted to say leading, I don't know why I skipped that part, but it's one of the leading Dutch national newspapers. And I always considered myself a narrative journalist, um, which meant for me that I tried to steer clear, steer clear of uh, being too focused on just one subject. I wanted to have the freedom to seek out stories where they were. And I didn't want to be locked down in the specialism where I had to follow every development because I wanted to see where stories led me and let them lead me to different stories. But it also turned out to have a bit of a downside because when this very interesting case popped up and everybody in the newspaper room was talking about it, this was not a case I was uh, allowed to seek out because jihadism or radicalism was not my specialty because I didn't have a specialty except what I considered storytelling, which basically is knowing nothing. And for months on end, we didn't really learn too much about this case. And then out of, and I have to be honest about this, nothing but sheer luck and pure coincidence, um, this story ended up in my lap. All the months, that this girl, which, who quickly became known as Laura H, um, was being held in the terrorism department, her father was fuming on the inside. He was seeing the way media were covering her story. And because she was the only famous example of a Dutch uh, ISIS returnee, every time a story about ISIS was written, there was a reference to her case and say, repeating the speculations that this girl might be back to carry out an attack. And after a while, after a couple of months, he decided to seek out at least one person in the Dutch press uh, to tell his story to, to correct, as he saw it, the narrative that had been repeated and repeated in Dutch media. And that person was not me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that person was a colleague who had just moved abroad. Um, and the colleague, for reasons that I'm still not entirely sure, uh, casually forwarded this email to me saying, well, do I have time Tuesday next week to go to Sweet Lake City uh, to interview the father of this Laura H? And I really didn't know that much about this case at the time, but I said, yeah, sure, I think I'm free Tuesday. Um, so I made an, an appointment with her father and I traveled to uh, to Sutomir to at least uh, get, a, get the first interview with the father of the, the famous Dutch jihadi. And there are these moments, uh, I guess, in your life that uh, in the, after all, you don't really realize at the time, but they change everything for you. Uh, and it can be the birth of a child maybe or in marriage, but for me it was like a, an almost uh, casu casually forwarded email that <laughs> changed everything. So I rang the doorbell in Sweet Lake City and her father answered the door. And he turned out to be a government employee, uh, quite a, just a regular successful man with blonde curls who welcomed me in and said, sit down here, have some coffee. And he started telling his story to me. And the story he was telling me was so radically different from what we've been hearing in the media so far, but also so extreme, so almost unfathomably far-fetched that I really didn't know what to make of it. And what was supposed to be an interview assignment that maybe took me an hour and a half, just an interview with the father of a jihadi, uh, talking about how terrible it is when your family gets into trouble like this or how it is to lose your daughter like that, turned out to be a completely different narrative. Now I had a government employee telling me that Laura H. Was, had been part of a secret, covert program um, instigated by at least a part of the Dutch government uh, that had helped him get her back from ISIS territory and that there had been an operation, a secret operation to get her across front lines and get her back to the Netherlands. And this was a man that was fuming with anger because the government, that same government, according to him, was prosecuting her and suspecting her of wanting to carry out a terrorist attack. 
And I think for the first time in my career of a couple of years, um, I walked out of that interview and I called my editor um, at the domestic desk and I told him that I can't write this interview, not because it's there's no story there, but because there's too much story there and it would not be proper or even responsible to have this one person making this insane accusations and telling this crazy story about uh, about this case that we've all been uh, we've all been covering for a long time um, to just print this because this this needed more research it needed it needed more time so because of this um, I got to be the one for this newspaper to, to follow Laura's case and up until that point she was still being held in the terrorism cell in full isolation unwilling to speak to anybody nobody could reach her and you see this is the one courtroom drawing of her of the first time she appeared months before I got involved with the case but in the dates afterwards she was she spent her time in the courtroom in a plastic yeah, container almost so nobody even got a vision of what she looked like uh, and she stayed silent and I started following this case and what started happening here usually in journalism the most difficult thing is to get people to trust you and to talk to you at least especially in sensitive cases like this um, but going to courtroom to the court day after day I'm somehow miraculously people were opening up to me not just her father uh, and after a while her mother but also the um, uh, the two sisters of her husband uh, the one she claimed had kidnapped her and who was left behind wounded in enemy territory so I started to get more and more information about this girl and the story was getting crazier as well because some other th another thing that usually happens when you cover a story or you research a story is that you start out with a pretty extreme wild premise but the more you research the more nuanced and layered it becomes and um, the more layers are peeled back and in the end the story is usually not as exciting as you thought it would be but here more twists and turns started coming so after uh, a few months of covering this trial, a new video appeared that seemed to change everything. This was a video, supposedly, at least claimed by an Iraqi journalist, of Laura's husband. The same person she had claimed in the video before was left behind and supposedly died on the battlefield while trying to make their escape. So I was faced with, <laughs> with a case that has just so many angles and so many stories and I was getting more and more intrigued by everything that I decided that just covering this for the newspaper was not enough. Uh, it, it wouldn't allow me to spend the time I needed to uncover everything that was there. And also I started to feel that this story was maybe worth telling uh, had had more potential uh, with uh, telling in a book than just a series of articles. So I was started talking to everybody in the environment, letting them know that I had an intention of starting to write a book and really make a narrative of this story and what I could figure out. But the one thing I didn't know is if she would be willing to talk to me. Um, but I decided anyway I would write a book about this case, there were enough people there, there was enough information, and I would research it, but still, I tried. And the one person that could visit her in her isolation, holding in the prison in, uh, in Vught, was her father. So I asked him, the next time you visit your daughter, could you please ask her if maybe, at any point in the future, when she, if she will ever get released, if she might consider talking to me? and telling her story for a book, uh, which I figured probably didn't have that much chance of success. But after a couple of days, he returned and he said, yeah, yeah, she, she wants to talk to you. Um, 
and that happened. Uh, the day after she spent a full year in prison, uh, she was sentenced to that same year. So she was free uh, with uh, a lot of conditions uh, on probation. And the day after she was released, I uh, traveled back to Sweet Lake City and I was introduced to this girl. And at that time, I had literally thousands of page, pages of documentation on her case. Uh, her family had, and the family of uh, her husband had shared with me everything they had, from diary entries to school reports from her primary school and his primary school to thousands of pages of personal um, uh, text messaging and apps and emails uh, from prison. She gave me full access to her uh, police dossier, which was, I think, about 2,000 pages long. Um, she gave me access to her psycho psychological evaluation. So I had a feeling I knew everything there was to know about this girl and even about this case because everything she'd ever said to police or anyone was in my possession. So I walked back into that same kitchen in Zutemir where uh, a year earlier I had met her father and now she was suddenly standing there in front of me, a girl who had never physically seen or laid eyes on or even had a conversation with and who I was supposed to know so much about. Uh, and I couldn't really mutter m m anything else than, hey, how, how are you? <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> because there was just so much I wanted to ask her. But then something else happened, because I figured, well, she will be a source in my book, and she will be a very important source, but she will be just one of the people I speak to for this story. And we had our first interview appointment, um, and we were sitting in, her, uh, in, in the bedroom of her uh, grandmother's uh, house um, and she was wearing an ankle bracelet. It was a very weird time because she was very, very young. I mean, she was very frail. Uh, she was so skinny that even adult handcuffs wouldn't fit on her so they would use, have to use children ones. And I was thinking, everything I know about you, how does that compute with the way you look and the way you seem? Because she seemed like a cheerful, light-hearted person. And still I was sitting across from a well, con person convicted of uh, terrorism in the Netherlands. And she started telling her story. And that, for me, completely changed the way that I was going to write this book. Because she turned out to be an exceptional storyteller. A storyteller, I, I've never met since or before uh, encountered anybody that I was writing about that was had such a gift of transporting me to her experiences and to everything that she had felt and done and seen. And she had a bizarrely uh, a great visual memory. So she was able to draw maps of rooms she was in and that I, a lot of them I later managed to ver verify that her memory really was amazing. So, uh, during that process, I was supposed to be a couple of appointments with her for a couple of hours to get her side of the story to include in a book I was writing. I decided that there was something else uh, I could do here. It was a unique chance to not only present the facts of what happened here, and to show my research of what, what my research in this case had turned up. But because she was able to transport me and to help me maybe not even understand, but at least feel uh, why she made the decisions she made and why she ended up joining ISIS and how she managed to get back, I thought it was a, uh, also a chance for the reader to do the same, to tell not just this, the, the facts of her story, but to shape a narrative in which you could, as a reader, experience what she had experienced and feel why she did the things she did. Um, I hope I'm clear uh, what I mean. It's just an un the unfiltered experience of everything that she has experienced from childhood on until the point that she uh, was standing trial in the Netherlands. Um, without judgment, without reflection, just making you feel, showing you what she had done, as she was able to tell me. But that was a problem for me as well. 
because I am a journalist and I have an obligation to be transparent about the, the research I'm doing. And this was a famous case in the Netherlands with a lot of suspicion around, uh, surrounding it. The, for the entire duration of the trial, a cloud of suspicion had been hanging over it because it was deemed impossible to escape. And how did she escape? And what were her intentions? So I decided that if I wanted to let her, the, the way she was including me in her story and her life, be a big part of the book, um, I had to divide the narrative in two separate strings. One, letting Laura tell you and show you everything that she had experienced from childhood on, her entire radicalization process uh, to, to the, 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 the situations that led up to her deciding to leave for Syria. But I had also had to show what my research had turned up and how I, I knew that what she was telling me was true, which seems like a bit, which felt like a bit of a paradox. Because if I write uh, a piece of the book telling you that Laura is running through the desert with bullets flying uh, 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 around her, uh, her husband getting his leg uh, blown up with the the legs, the bones sticking out, and her deciding to leave. How do I at the same time, if I wanted to make that a, a sensory experience, unfiltered, just what she's going through, how do I at the same time show a reader um, that what I know to be true and how I found out that this was true? Um, so I decided to construct a narrative uh, divided with the one narrative uh, being her life from basically her birth until uh, her trial. And the other one starting in the opposite direction with the video you just saw and the information that I had um, at the time I started getting into this, uh, get into this case and researching this case and somehow uh, uh, intertwining them. And my relationship with Laura was vital uh, to the research because on the one hand um, I had to verify all the facts she was telling me but on the other hand her experiences and her personal feelings were such a big part of the story that I had to spend more and more time with her as well and that evolved into quite a complicated relationship because after a while not even that long I started to realize that I don't think ever before in her life had she told anyone as much about who she was and what she did and uh, then uh, uh, than she had told me before. So after a while, I knew considerably more about her uh, than, for example, her parents. And after a while, uh, also, the, for example, the Justice Department. And at the same time, I was trying to understand this girl, but I was also a journalist checking, trying to check everything. And we made an agreement when we started. Laura, you're going to tell me everything and I'm going to write down everything, and I'm going to check everything. And if I come across, across anything that doesn't add up, or where I found, find evidence that you're lying to me, I will write that down as well. But it, 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 um, it made our relationship complicated. So after a while, I started to notice I didn't know how to greet her. Because when I arrived at her doorstep, uh, giving her a hand formally every time seemed ridiculous because we got to know each other for so in, in a very intimate way or at least i got to know her and spending hours and hours the, the, the day before talking about her most intimate experiences uh or for example the graphic way she described that her the, the abuse she suffered suffered from her husband uh took place this is a drawing she made of herself that was included in her police file to show uh, just the amount of uh, uh, abuse she suffered on a daily basis, which according to her was a big part uh, of wanting to leave the Netherlands. But these were um, things her parents didn't even know. So giving her a hand <laughs> handshake seems just an insane uh, way to approach her. But it also didn't feel right to give her a hug or to kiss her because at the same time, I was checking her story and there was always, even in my head, this, yeah, this black box of you never know what you don't know. And any journalist here can tell you, you're never sure when you're being lied to, when somebody is being honest. Um, 
So this was, she was either the most exceptional storyteller I had ever met or the most exceptional liar. And my person, personally, I really didn't think she was lying to me. I don't think anybody was, is, almost anybody is capable of lying to that extent just because the sheer amount of detail uh, that she managed to reprodu reproduce about her time in the caliphate and her life. Um, but still, it was always part in the back of my mind. And because the Dutch public had always been fed doubts about her case, uh, I needed to make, I needed to be sure. But how could I ever, ever be sure about what happened in conflict zone 2,000 miles, no, a lot more, I think. <laughs> I'm not going to make an estimation here, but, uh, but a conflict zone halfway around the world in Syria and Iraq, where she was the sole witness I had access to for most of the events that were there. Um, so after spending months on end, a couple of days a week for hours and hours with her, recording everything, uh, arranging everything in order, I decided there was only one way I could narratively construe the story the way I wanted to, with unbridled sensory experience that she was having, um, if there was still any doubt about the way she managed to escape the caliphate. Because that was the, 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 the key to everything. The whole reason she was ever suspected of having an assignment by ISIS, of having dark intentions for her return, was the notion that it was not possible to escape. Um, so I decided there was only one way to do that, and I had to travel uh, to Iraq myself. The one thing the prosecutor's office in the Netherlands couldn't do, basically, not just because I wanted to find out what I could find out there, but to be able to tell the story uh, the way I wanted to, to show absolute proof um, that I did everything I could to uh, uncover the truth here. Um, so I did travel uh, to Iraq, and I had all the information that she had given me about the day of her escape, um, but yeah, the one thing I had to do was find witnesses to, uh, who were there on the front lines between ISIS territory and Kurdish territory on that morning of the 12th of July, where she had made her escape. Um, and the big question was, is she telling the truth? Is it true that she just drove up the front line in a car with her kids and her husband there, and they just started running three miles through enemy territory while being shot at from ISIS side? And was it true that he got left behind? And she, a 20-year-old girl with a one-year-old baby, and a four-year-old daughter somehow managed to make it to the other side. I mean, you can hear when somebody tells you a story like this, there's a voice in the back of your mind saying, this, is, this can be real. In real life, it's never the girl and the children uh, that safely escape. So I spent time in Iraq with one basic purpose, finding witnesses um, to the escape she made. Was it true that she was telling me? And if I could find proof, I could be confident enough to um, write the story, construe the story narratively as I wanted to do, through, with a lot of it being through her eyes. Um, and in the end, I did actually find an eyewitness. And it took me a long time. It was a very frustrating experience because every Kurdish general I spoke to said, of course, I know everything about this case. You come visit my house tomorrow and I'll tell you everything about it. So the first time I thought, I can't believe I'm so lucky. Uh, and I spent four hours uh, traveling to the other side of Iraqi Kurdistan, drinking tea with a general. And I was informed, don't be too eager, just be polite and hear him out. And after a couple of hours, he put his hand on my knee and said, okay, I'm ready to tell you everything. This girl, she was on TV. <laughs> and she gave an interview saying she was abducted by her husband. <laughs> and this happened to me, I think, three or four times. <laughs> And in my last day in Iraq, which I'd always given up hope that I would be able to find out exactly what had happened that day, uh, except her story. And I was giving up hope that I would be able to uh, tell the story the way I wanted to. And then, um, again, a completely, 
completely lucky shot that happened. Uh, there was uh, a fixer there. Somebody had been working for uh, international journalism for, uh, for a long time. And actually a Dutch colleague of mine who had been living in Iraq introduced me to him. And he said, yeah, 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 no, I know the general that was stationed at that post on the front line on that day. So on my last day in uh, Iraq, I traveled with this general uh, to the exact location uh, where she turned up on the early morning of July 12th. And this is the view the Kurds had, where indeed, as she was telling it, in the early morning, a car suddenly drove into the front line. And that's something that had, for the entirety of the war, according to this general, never happened before. Because this is flat territory, and driving a car through this flat territory during wartime was considered to be nothing short of a, of a suicide mission. And yes, he said, you see the line in the back there, that was the, the, the trench that she had described to me that she had to crawl through, uh, through in order to get to the other side. Uh, this is the general in question. I included too many vacation photos here, I think. But uh, <laughs> and indeed, he managed to confirm to me uh, that she was with her husband. And yes, he said, the husband got shot by a tank, by us. And he left be it was left behind, and he was still lying there the next day. So in the end, her story uh, checked out. Uh, and I had indeed managed to find proof that the escape happened the way it did. I will translate a bit in English, but there was a tank stationed on that mountain range there, and it shot for uh, it shot a, a, a propelled missile or a rocket for about three miles in the direction of the car that she was in, and it narrowly missed her. It killed one ISIS fighter. It gravely, severely injured her husband, but it missed Laura, and Laura indeed had been uh, managed to make it to the other side, clutching a baby uh, um, and a child. So I can't describe to you the relief I felt at that moment, uh, not just because I managed to uncover what had happened here, but also because this way I could tell the story exactly the way I wanted to through her eyes, because now I had proof uh, of the most important facts, uh, or at least discussion points, uh, uh, or doubts that surrounded her case. Uh, so I started writing, and um, I came across a, a next problem, because there's no way to chronologically write a story like this. Because if I tell you she runs across the desert, she feels uh, the, the, the bullets flying across her hair, I can't 200 pages later inform you how I learned that to be true. So I had to construe a narrative where these uh, two lines um, uh, uh, inter-exchange. Um, but it was, for me, um, I, did, I was aware of the risk of telling a story this way because you have to do your fact-checking probably even uh, more thoroughly than if you just have someone tell you their memories and if you write, well, Laura remembers how she was running through the desert and she remembers climbing through um, a trench, narrowly escaping death. If you write, she runs through the desert and she climbs through a trench, you better be uh, pretty damn sure. Um, so the book was released in November, which had, was one of the most nerve-wracking experiences of <laughs> my life, uh, because it was my first book. Um, but it was, it was also nerve-wracking for, for a different reason, because, as I said, I knew more about her and of her intimate personal experiences than, for example, her parents. And this was a time that her whole life had, would be unveiled uh, for anybody who wanted to read it. Uh, so... The day it was released, uh, there was quite a bit of media coverage uh, comparable to the day she turned up in the first place. Uh, so I was also a bit concerned about the way she would be handling it. So I sent her a text message asking her, how are you doing? Are you okay today on this day of your story being everywhere? Uh, and she just sent me back a picture of the Sinterklaas parade in Sweet Lake City with her children, hardly aware that her story was out there because she had different things in her mind than narrative journalism on that day. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> hey. 
they liked it. Uh, I'm sure there are questions. Um, I will get to you with a microphone, and Sarah is going to help me. Questions? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, and please uh, uh, tell us who you are. Uh, Kalim Blonde. Um I'm a TV journalist. If uh, your research uh, showed that Laura wasn't telling the truth, how would your book have turned out? I think it would have. Uh, I would have found a different narrative structure, where I would have um, made her a very important source. But um, the the, the fact-checking of her story uh, would would have been the the narrative backbone. And here I switch it around. I think the the, the her life experiences were the narrative backbone, and my research was supportive of that narrative. And there would, be, would have been no way to do that if I had found out she had lied. And I even des um, decided for myself that if I caught her with a small lie, even something not vitally important to her story, but just a small lie, I decided, and I told her this as well, this is going to change the entire way I write this book. Because if you're but telling how, you know, how do you know if it's a lie or a mistake? Because we also make That's a very good question, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think I have an answer for that. I think it would be uh, important what it was about. I mean, if she said, no, it were green shoes, and I found, it, I found out it were red shoes, it would be something else. That if she said, no, I've never been uh, in that building in Raqqa, and I found documents that she was. So I had decided that if I caught her with a lie, I would drastically uh, change my narrative. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do it this way. Thank you. I'm Mark Kramer. Um, it sounds like you had an almost therapeutic relationship with her, that you were in the same kind of position that a therapist listening intensively to somebody would have. Did you feel a responsibility because of that and worry that that responsibility would influence your selection of details? That's a very good question, because it was, in the end, a complicated, complicated relationship. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I tried to make sure myself that it wouldn't influence my selection. And I think uh, there's some ways I tried to do that, but one of them was to not start writing immediately after uh, a session with her, if you want to call it that, uh, but to wait and first gather everything, and then with some distance uh, going through the facts and fact-checking, uh, so that I wouldn't make my selection based on the emotions she was uh, portraying just after uh, our talks together. But I, I did feel, in the end, some responsibility, because um, this is not just a story about crime, uh, or guilt, or terrorism, or jihadism, but it's also a very personal and intimate story of a girl growing up, uh, and it's also about the first sexual experiences she had uh, that were very formative, terrible experiences, but were very formative, and uh, the reason she converted to Islam, and uh, so I did feel responsibility there. Um, so I was very happy that I wasn't just in touch with her, but also, for example, with her parents and uh, people surrounding her. But I did make the agreement that I was the one making the selection. I get to choose what to write down or not and to choose what is important. So I didn't leave room for them to afterwards say, well, we told you this, but we after, after the fact, we don't want this in the book anymore. So I... In the end, I thought, because also it was a very serious uh, criminal case, that I thought the facts were, in the end, o should always be more important than the, um, the, yeah, the personal feelings uh, that she or they might have. Hi. Sorry, sorry, just wondering, yeah. but to their credit, um, that did not occur. There was not even one instance where her family or she, uh, before reading it, uh, said, well, we're, we don't feel comfortable about this. They honored their agreement that they would tell me and give me everything, and I would be able to use everything. Hi, Geert Walhof. How did the, the idea to do a podcast at the same time, how did that come up, that idea? Because that's a very interesting combination. And did when did that come into the process? I wish I had so much better answer than this, but it was um, a, a very smart move in the marketing department of my uh, my publisher. <laughs> but no, they, they figured they were, um, she's a very gifted storyteller. And 
I in my book I, that is you, you can sense that she is from the book, but um, there are obvious limitations to written journalism, and a podcast would be a very good way to let her immerse you as a listener in her story, to hear her voice, the actual person that went through all this, with at the same time um, restricting her, or still respecting her, uh, not respecting, uh, protecting her um, identity. Because you saw her face here, but she's not recognized, uh, not recognizable she, uh, in the street. And it's very important to Child Protective Services and to the, the intelligence, uh, Dutch intelligence agency, that she's not recognizable in the street. And this is a way to have her tell her story unfiltered, but just hearing her and not seeing her. Um, and also, there were two very gifted uh, podcast makers uh, interested interested in the story, which helped me convince that this is just a very good way to uh, take a different narrative approach to this story. Okay, Hanneke Brière, I'm from the Master of Design in Rotterdam. Um, did you, in your research, uh, also try to find out how the uh, um, forming of remembrance works? So, in on more on the meta level of looking at this story, or were were you just following the story and the fact checking? Yeah, I I tried for a bit, but it's uh, there's so much to be read on there. Uh, I I think I tried to make uh, in the end I made my own uh, distinctions and what memories I would use and what memories I wouldn't. Um, I mean, she was quite consistent or very consistent actually in uh, most of her memories but I had a feeling this is more hazy uh, and I just chose to not select those memories I guess but I think the what I did learn is I not even for one scene or one memory I uh, stuck to just the first time she told me I kept asking and re-asking and re-asking re-asking sometimes with weeks in between to see if there is any uh, uh, change in discourse or if she remembers anything differently uh, just to be sure I guess but memory is obviously a very tricky thing um, so it's a good question yeah we can do one more yeah. hello oh. <laughs> Um, Two more. <laughs> yeah. I'm Kat Slazler. I'm an independent radio maker. Um, I'm wondering, like, you're talking about unfiltered facts and also uh, unfiltered emotion. And obviously, it's still going to be you filtering, like, always the person who chooses how you order the words, the person who asks the questions, the person loud eyes looking at. And I'm wondering how you, like, practically had that conversation with yourself and also how you went about having that conversation with your editor of, like, your own filtering. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's no such thing as unfiltered information or emotion because I, I still selected it. Um, yeah, I guess it's always trying to find a balance between how certain scenes or facts uh, support or are important to the narrative or are crucial to your understanding of the case, I guess. Uh, but in the end, it's obviously, it's always a selection. Uh, because it's not a diary. I mean, some days in our life I will devote 10 pages to, and sometimes it's uh, it's just a couple of lines, and uh, it's a couple of weeks of her life. So it's obviously a selection, me saying I find this more important uh, than that. Um, but I started out, in this case, from a position of basically zero information. So I think, I hope that helped me in making the selection and what you really needed to know and understand and could be wondering about what was true or not in this case. Um, but it, is, it was always a very difficult decision and there's always obviously a risk there that you choose to select certain events and facts because they support the narrative and other which others you don't. Well, maybe for her they were just as formative or important. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't have a better answer than I really tried to strike a balance there. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, there, there was still the story of the father uh, about uh, the government planning this escape. Yeah. And there was also a story about a guy he hired, I thought. Yeah. And so I was wondering, did you try to find out more about this narrative or about, uh, did you try to interview the government? The government, but yeah. Oh, I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. No, I did. Yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, and it, it turned out there was a whole lot more uh, to that story than I could possibly have fathomed and in the end uh, it turned out that the father was 
uh, telling the truth. He paid 10,000 euros, um, instigated by a Dutch government-related uh, um, foundation that for a while had kept a sec secret pro program uh, against direct orders from the government uh, supporting parents to get back their children from uh, ISIS territory. So he was indeed uh, consulted and helped and uh, he informed that branch of government on every step he was taking. It's just that these government branches didn't communicate this uh, amongst themselves. So yeah, in the end <laughs> he was right. There is of course one question still unanswered. Did you give her a hand, a hug, or a kiss? <laughs> in the end, well, we sort of made an agreement about it. I, after a while, it just became too well, uncomfortable. Every time you were like, what, what? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now we're just saying like this, hey. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we just, uh, I said, okay, how, how do you want to do this? I explained my dilemma. And I did that multiple times uh, in, in different situations as well, because I wanted to make sure she knew she was talking to a reporter and not yeah. somebody. Your friend, who, your not, psychiatrist. Yeah, not just somebody interested in her and her life yeah. story. Uh, yeah. So in the end, it was became sort of a, awkward half-hug thing. <laughs> okay. But it's thank, a hug now. It's a <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, you were so lucky getting that email, but uh, actually I think we were very lucky you got that email too. Thank, thank you, you very Thomas. much. Thank you, Thomas.